Hi, I'm Jay from Real Street Performance. Today we're going to talk about wheel speed sensors and how they interact with traction control systems. We're going to discuss the two different types of sensors used, different approaches on getting accurate wheel speed data into the ECU, and how proper ECUs use that information to make a faster and safer vehicle. Now there are a couple different reasons of why you'd want a properly working traction control system. First would be drag racing. So you're drag racing a vehicle and you want to be able to basically print time slips. With a proper drive shaft speed control system in place, you can literally ask for a 11260 foot time and get a 11260 foot time. It's really an amazing system and has changed the game in drag racing for a number of years now. In fact, most drive shaft speed control systems were outlawed early on because they wanted to have the racer kind of in contact with the opportunity and obstacles involved with changing track conditions. My favorite reason for having a track control system is the safety aspect. You have a lot of cars that are very high power vehicles, vehicles that are making three, four times the amount of power they did from the factory and managing traction is quite a big obstacle. I know you're a good driver and I know you don't think it would happen to you, but there's no shortage of incidents where vehicles are lost because too much wheel speed was involved and the vehicle had a crash. So to get started on retrofitting a traction control system on a vehicle that didn't come with a traction control system, we wanna know what's running your speedometer. How does your vehicle know how fast it's moving? Some factory systems are run off of the ABS tone rings, which is a very high tooth count and will make for excellent traction control. And some vehicles have a very low tooth count. So if your vehicle has a four or five tooth reluctor running the speedometer, that's not gonna be good data because you have too many degrees of rotation of power between the ECU knowing where the drive shaft is located. So if you have a five tooth reluctor on your drive shaft, that means your drive shaft is turning 72 degrees before the computer knows where the drive shaft location is and you get very steppy speed control. So it's not gonna be a very fine thing. Yes, it will work, but it won't work nearly as good as when you have a higher tooth count drive shaft speed sensor. So for example, this is a five tooth drive shaft speed sensor. You can see that the speed input is stair stepping and here's a 32 tooth speed input where you can see that the speed line is very smooth and an excellent opportunity to have proper drive shaft speed control. The focus of this video is on two wheel drive vehicles. So vehicles that have a driven set of wheels and a non-driven set of wheels. If you have a four wheel drive vehicle and you want traction control, it's just a bit more complicated and I'd like to answer those questions in email. If you're retrofitting traction control on a vehicle that has an existing electronic speed input, it's important to know two things about that speed input. Is that speed input on a driven or non-driven wheel and whether or not it has a tooth count that's gonna offer you enough resolution to have precise traction control. Now let's talk about the reluctor tooth count or tone ring tooth count and how it interacts with the system's resolution. An example of that is anti-lock brakes. Those of you that have driven early 90s emerging anti-lock brake technology, you often went into a panic stop and you had an interrupted skid. So you'd apply the brake at full power and you'd get a er, 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 as the vehicle lost traction, regained traction, lost traction, regained traction. As those systems evolved and you got into higher tooth count tone rings like this 48 tooth ring, you can go into a full panic stop without hearing a noise out of the tire. You're maintaining 100% traction and stopping that vehicle as fast as possible. And this 48 tooth ring is updating the ABS computer every seven and a half degrees of where exactly that tire is in its rotation. If you had a four tooth reluctor on a wheel speed sensor, you're only updating the ECU every 90 degrees of rotation and that's just not enough to have fine control. So if you think about traction control as the inverse of ABS, it's easy to understand why you want the driven wheels to have a high resolution sensor and a high resolution tooth count. That way you know exactly where the horsepower is in relation to available traction and you can mitigate that horsepower and have the vehicle maintain the maximum amount of traction available to accelerate the vehicle as fast as possible. To put that information into context, let's first talk about our non-driven wheel speed. Real Street's efforts at Bonneville have retrofitted sensors and reluctors on the cars that didn't have any equipped. And we had to pick not only the tooth count we were going to use, but the sensor type and create brackets, so on and so forth, to have a encompassed system that would offer repeatable, robust, reliable information for the ECU to work with. And in order to do that, we picked a 12 tooth trigger. 
12 teeth on a non-driven wheel, updates the ECU every 30 degrees of rotation, and because that wheel's not having any power applied to it, 30 degrees was plenty. It offered us a wide tooth, and if we got into any vibration or anything out there on the salt or at El Mirage, we would have a repeatable signal to work with. As far as our driven wheel speed, we wanted more resolution. We opted with a 32 tooth wheel on the drive shaft, and that's gonna offer the MoTeC pretty consistent updates and let the ECU know if it needs to reduce ignition timing, reduce throttle angle, insert some cuts, whether they be ignition cuts or fuel cuts, and possibly reduce the target boost level in order to maintain the slip aim that we're using to keep the car safe. One of the liabilities with either one of those cars out there at Bonneville is that you can just cook the tires off of it. So with the Streamliner, we had some tire related failures when we raced it a couple years ago and we wanted less wheel slip in order to maintain good tire life and not overheat the tire and have a tire possibly come apart and crash the car. When shopping for a speed sensor, you're gonna find there's two different options on sensor types. The first is gonna be a VR or mag sensor. This sensor creates voltage when it passes the tooth of the reluct ring and it's gonna be a variable voltage scale. So at low speed, you may not have any signal at all. And at high speed, you may have a high voltage output. So you're gonna to need to calibrate that within your ECU's parameters. The second type would be a digital or hall sensor. That's a powered sensor that outputs a fixed square wave signal. And it's very easy to set up and calibrate. The VR sensors may have a higher speed capacity, but if you've calculated the right amount of teeth, along with your tire height and max speed, either sensor is a fine option. Now, once you've picked out what you're gonna do for a reluctor and what you're gonna do for a sensor, we need to make sure that the installation is done correctly. Here's an example of two different vehicles that have the same exact reluctor wheels with the same exact sensors, but one of them is a mess and one of them is totally clean data. The car that is a mess, the actual bracket that's holding the speed sensor in place is flexing and vibrating and that disrupts the signal. This is a game of garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have very clean signals going into the ECU, you can expect the ECU to be repeatable in its ability to manage traction. So don't skimp on the fabrication of any of these components because you'll spend 80% of the money to get 0% of the gain. If you have an older vehicle that had factory ABS, but the ABS is no longer working due to the vehicle's age and you can't fix it because of part availability, you could do what I've done here for my 90s Toyota Supra. I've retrofitted a modern hall sensor into a bracket that bolts into the factory spindle and reads off the factory tone ring. This gives me a clean, accurate, repeatable signal without having to deal with 20 plus year old components. Now let's discuss different strategies available depending on the ECU. So the first would be that drive shaft speed control that we mentioned earlier on in the video. A properly tuned drive shaft speed control system can literally print time slips. So if you want to go 440 to the eighth, and you've got the power to do it, and you've done it before, there's your drive shaft speed line, you plug it into the computer, that's what you're gonna get. The downside of those types of systems is let's say the air is better, the track is better, the car could have gone a little faster, but you'll be riding that same drive shaft speed line unless it has an adaptive control in it, where it's able to add some power based off of conditions. Not all systems are that in depth, but drive shaft speed control is an effective way to create a competitive, repeatable race car. The next would be a calculated gear ratio based system. So if you have a manual transmission and you know the gear ratios of the transmission and you know the tire height and you know your final drive and you know the vehicle speed, you can calculate a slip aim based off of gear ratio. This is a fine way to do things and quite a few different systems approach it this way. The next would be speed differential, where you know how fast your non-driven wheel is going and your driven wheel is going, and you pick a slip aim that accelerates the vehicle the fastest possible. So it's gonna be different on dirt than it would on concrete and depending on traction. Some tires don't do well with any slip and some tires need to be spinning some in order to have the most amount of vehicle acceleration possible. Here's a good example of drive shaft speed control in action at a drag strip. Our orange line is the actual drive shaft speed. Our red line is the drive shaft speed target. Purple is ignition retard that's going to be sourced from drive shaft speed control. Yellow is ignition timing retard sourced from traction control. And the green is the amount of race time on the pass. 
As the vehicle approaches the driveshaft speed line, it's met with a small amount of ignition retard. As the driveshaft speed line begins to get further above the target, it's met with larger amounts of ignition retard. Through this section here on the graph, you'd actually have a situation where it would break traction and you'd have to abort the run. But there's enough power reduction present that the tire stays hooked to the track and it goes on to spin again as it meets the one two gear change where large amounts of ignition retard settle the car down and keep it going down track. Out here on the two three gear change, you have another hike of the tire that's met with more ignition retard and again, just some wheel spin that's countered with ignition timing retard. Decaying the power, keeping the tire hooked to the track, keeping the car safe, keeping the car on a successful run, that's one of the things you can get out of good drive shaft speed control like this shown here. Now, not all ECUs are gonna try to maintain traction with the same type of approach. The simplest way to maintain traction is to use a variable engine speed limiter. So if the calculated engine speed in a given gear is 6,000 RPM, but the engine speed is 6,500 RPM because the tire is spinning a lot, the ECU can just whack it with ignition cuts. So you interrupt the power output of the engine by introducing misfires by cutting ignition cycles. So instead of the engine being fired every cycle, it may hit 25% cut or 5% cut or 50% cut, depending on the tuning involved. Now systems that are a little bit more involved like the MoTeC, they may take a if this then that approach. So for example, the MoTeC will first reduce the engine's ignition timing, lowering the power output first. If that isn't enough, they may use fuel cuts or ignition cuts. They could close the throttle or lower the boost level or do all of those things all at once, but basically leave the driver feeling safe and confident behind the wheel because they don't even know what's happening. So if you haven't experienced properly programmed, properly executed traction control, I highly recommend it. It can make for a faster, safer, and funner vehicle. I hope you've enjoyed this video. It's quite a bit of information, but properly executed traction control is a game changer. If you have any questions or comments about traction control, you can leave them below. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.